Hey, Brian Goulet here of the Goulet Pen Company and Ink Nouveau, and I'm here for the Goulet Q&A episode three. Um, getting a little bit better every time. I'm gonna try and keep this to a half hour. We'll see how that goes, but I got a bunch of good questions for you that I've gotten from Facebook, Twitter, uh, my email, YouTube, uh, Ink Nouveau, lots of good places. So I've got some questions. This is an open forum here uh, this week. Uh, I've had open forum on the last couple of Goulet Q&As and it's worked pretty well. I may try and be a little more focused next time in some future uh, Q&As, but anyway, I'll get to that more towards the end. So, um, uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and get right into it. You know, I've been kind of busy the last couple of weeks uh, trying to improve some things. We're moving a lot of stuff around here in the shop. Uh, if you've been paying attention at all to any of the um, newsletter videos that we've been putting up, uh, on YouTube, you know, Rachel and I have kind of been telling you what's been going on with the company, but we have uh, expanded some space, we're moving some stuff around, so pulled in a lot of directions right now. I've been a little behind on my emails. I'm really sorry about that if you have been uh, waiting, waiting on me for that, but uh, I'm going to try to, you know, keep up with everything as much as I can. I'm going to really try, especially this weekend, to get caught up. But anyway, so I got a whole bunch of questions here, and I'm just going to go ahead and kind of kick it off. Uh, the first one here is from Patrick on Facebook. And he said, what approach would you recommend for trying to improve one's handwriting? Uh, for instance, would you use formal drills like in the classic Palmer method? Any books or other materials you recommend? I'm an active member of the Fountain Pen Network and would certainly recommend browsing a site like that. I'm also happily, happily using E.C. Mill's modern business penmanship from 1903. I'm curious to hear your ideas. Okay, so I'm not like an expert when it comes to handwriting. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right off the bat. It is an area of weakness that I have, something that I would like to try to improve upon. Um, but I think like with anything else, uh, improvement comes upon practice. You know, I don't think it particularly matters as much for what method you're using more that you are just doing it regularly. You know, it's kind of like vacuuming or, you know, uh, dieting or exercising, whatever it is, whatever it is you're doing, you just got to do it regularly and you got to do it a lot uh, in order to get better. Like, you know, playing a musical instrument, for example. Um, it's very much like that. So, you know, the Palmer method, that's an older method of writing. Um, you know, that's the the cursive writing, you know, if you want to improve, that's definitely a way to go about it. Spencerian was an even older form of cursive writing than that. A lot of people really like Spencerian because it's, you know, very kind of elegant. So that might be something to look into. Just look up resources on Spencerian. But, you know, um, Patrick, you mentioned the Fountain Pen Network. And I think that is a, a really good resource and probably the best place, single place that I know to send you to. So let me go ahead and show you what that's all about. So this here is the Fountain Pen Network. If you've never seen this before, you probably want to familiarize yourself with it. There's a lot of great information here. It's actually kind of how I got my start learning about pens oh, four years ago or so when I started to get into it. Uh, lots of good stuff here, but what I want to focus on is if you scroll down, I'm on the main page right now, past all the reviews and past all the brand-oriented things. If you go down here to Creative Expressions, the subform at the top is Penmanship. So click on that. And what's going to come up is a variety of different threads and topics on all kinds of different things about handwriting. And there are some pinned topics that are here at the top. Um, the good one here is this first one, the books on italic writing and calligraphy. There's lots of good sources if you want to, you know, improve kind of fancier handwriting. Um, good recommendations here, you know, Right Now is a book, Italic Calligraphy and Handwriting, Handwriting for Today, The Art of Calligraphy. Um, lots of good stuff. And then there's um, various other, you know, books and things like that that you can use as good resources. And then, of course, there's individual um, topics that people have posted here. So you can do a search. If you're a member here, you can do a search within this subforum and try and find stuff on whatever given topic that you want. If there's a specific style of handwriting you want to learn more about. Or you can just kind of click through here and see what people are talking about. Or if you're a member, you can post and ask questions and get some advice from some other people. Uh, that are on the forum. So this is definitely the best place that I can think to get started uh, when it comes to learning more about resources for improving your handwriting. My next question comes from Stuart, and this was sent in an email. Stuart's got a little bit of a smart comment here. It said, do you own a shirt with a collar? I don't think I've ever seen you in any of your videos wear anything but a t-shirt in some form or another. Well, okay. 
I will give you that I have a relatively informal style of dress. Uh, I am kind of of the mentality that I didn't start my own business to wear clothes that I feel that other people want me to wear. I wanted to wear what I'm comfortable in, and I'm comfortable in t-shirts. Uh, a lot of us around the Goulet shop wear t-shirts, you know, that's part of the benefit of being a online company. Uh, that said, you know, I do own a couple of shirts with a collar. In fact, Stuart, if you go and you check the first Goulet Q&A video I did, technically that shirt has a collar. Yes, it's like a Dickies Mechanics shirt, but it's got a collar. And that's what you said. So, uh, no, but in all seriousness, I, I like to dress down. I'm very just down to earth. I do what I'm comfortable in. I'll wear a collar, you know, to church or to, you know, a nicer function of some kind. But generally speaking, if I have a choice about it, I'm going to wear something I'm comfortable in. With that said, in the wintertime, if you go look at some of my other videos, I wear a lot of flannel shirts and they have collars. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, kind of a nice little fun email there. Anyway, uh, so Inato18 on YouTube, you said, what's the difference between bulletproof and eternal inks? And can the difference be demonstrated? Um, I don't quite have the time in this video to actually demonstrate what the difference is, but honestly, there's not a lot of difference. Okay, so um, it is very confusing, and even I have a hard time really grasping all the differences between the different Noodler's Inc. classifications. Okay, Bulletproof and Eternal, those are both Noodler's Inc. terms that Nathan Tardif has come up with. Um, and really what happened was, you know, he started out making inks. He, he wanted to create permanent inks, right? fraud proof and fade resistant and that kind of thing. So he came out with the eternal inks first. That's what he coined as the you know fade proof archival inks, the permanent ones. Um, then he later came out with the term bulletproof further down the road. This was long before I was ever associated with Noodlers. So I'm a little fuzzy on the whole history and how it came about, but I've talked to him on the phone and essentially that's what I got was that you know there was Eternal first and then Bulletproof came along. But if you look on the Noodlers spreadsheet that we have on GouletPens.com, there isn't any Noodlers ink that is Eternal but not Bulletproof, okay? So really the two terms are, for all intents and purposes, uh, interchangeable. So I wouldn't sweat too much what the difference is. There is an eternal line of inks, which is, you know, the small one ounce bottles of ink. Um, those, you know, came out before bulletproof was a real coin term, but they, you know, they are bulletproof. So um, the whole idea behind all of them is that they are going to be fraud resistant, you know, bleach resistant, that kind of thing, um, water, waterproof or water resistant to a great degree, uh, and archival. So that's really the important thing with both the bulletproof and eternal links. Okay. Hopefully that clears it up a little bit for you. There's a lot of kind of confusing terms that are used around there, but that maybe that helps you out a little bit. Okay. Mike N, you sent me an email and you said, how does the flex of the new platinum cool compare to the Noodler's Ahab nibs? Does it take more or less pressure to get line variation? Okay, so I did a review on the Platinum Cool. I've done some past videos on the Noodler's Ahabs uh, and the Conrad and the Nib Creeper. Um, I don't find that there's much of a difference between the Ahab Conrad and Nib Creeper in terms of the degree of flex and stuff like that. I feel like the Ahab and the Conrad, because the pens are a little bit bigger than the Creeper, flex a little easier, but the, the actual performance of the nib themselves doesn't get any wider or narrower with how you're pressing. Um, I did find that the Cool um, it's, keep in mind the Cool is not technically uh, a flex pen, it just has a nib that has some flexibility to it, and I was kind of clear about that in the Platinum Cool video. Uh, so the Platinum Cool itself does not flex as well or as much as the Ahab or the Conrad. Um, it doesn't flex quite as wide, it doesn't write quite as wet. Um, it does have quite a bit of line variation for a conventional fountain pen, which is how the pen is marketed. Um, so I would say if you want a pen for flexing primarily, go with the Ahab or the Conrad. You're going to get a higher ink capacity in those. You're going to get a bigger nib. It's going to be more intended for flexing on a regular basis. Um, if you want a pen that's going to be primarily used for conventional writing, but you just want to flex it every now and then, that might be where you'd want the cool. So that's kind of where I'd, where I'd say the cool doesn't flex quite as much as the Ahab does. Um, but it's got some other advantages to it. So hopefully that helps you out. 
Um, and as well, as far as the pressure goes to, I feel like the cool requires a little bit more pressure than the Ahab, um, which is why it's a little bit better as a conventional pen. And it's available in two nib sizes, a fine and a medium. So the fine gets a little finer than the Ahab does. So maybe that's worth something to you. Um, okay, Philip C. In an email, you said, which non-black inks fade less over time when used in journals? I like blue, such as Azagao, or red inks, such as Diamine Oxblood. I also like Diamine Ancient Copper. Any recommendations for which may resist fading the best? Um, the inks that will resist fading the best are pigmented inks. Um, the only, there's not a lot of them out there. Um, and they do have higher maintenance that goes along with them than conventional fountain pen inks. Uh, but the Sailor has a couple different ones, the Seiboku and the, um, the Kiwaguro. And that's just a blue and a blue-black. Or sorry, a blue-black and a black. And then Platinum has four different ones. They have the Platinum Carbon Black, which you asked about non-blacks, but they have a pigmented blue. So if you like a blue that's kind of similar to Azagal, not quite as purple, but is similar, the Platinum Pigment Blue, um, that might be a good option for you. They also have a pigmented rose red, which is kind of a pinky red color, um, and then pigmented sepia, which is kind of a light brown uh, with some red to it. So not going to be as, as quite as intense as Oxblood to any degree. But those would probably be some of your better options. Um, the reason is because they have actual pigment in the ink, and pigment resist fading like a million times better than dye-based inks do. Most fountain pen inks, with the exception of the six that I just mentioned from Platinum and Sailor, uh, most fountain pen inks are dye-based, and dyes are inherently terrible at resisting UV ex you know, exposure and radiation. So anytime you've got fluorescent lights or sunlight or anything like that, and the ink is being exposed to it for a long period of time, it's going to fade. And that's pretty much true for just about any fountain pen ink. Now, there are some that are better than others. Um, noodlers like the Bulletproofs and the Eternals, uh, those the ones that are classified as that, are going to be better than most. Um, but if you're talking about blues and that as a gal, like that, that kind of cobalt blue range, and then reds, reds are notoriously terrible at resisting UV, and so are the blues in that range. So it's going to be really tough to find something that's going to hold up to UV. Uh, but that said, basically, if you're keeping it closed and not exposing it to UV a lot, you're going to really help yourself out a lot in terms of how much you're going to fight that fading tendency, I guess. That's really the key. No matter what ink you're using, you know, make sure that the paper you're using is acid-free, pH neutral, and is being stored properly you know, in a cool, dry place. Um, not going to get wet or anything like that. If you have it in a basement, don't keep it on the floor in case there's ever flooding. Um, you know, so, and if you can keep it sealed up, you know, that would be even better, like in plastic or something. Um, but if you, um, if you are going to be exposing it to sunlight, you know, getting those Noodler's um, inks would probably help you out. Um, I actually did a collaborative blog post with Jamie Grossman of um, Hudson Valley Sketches blog. Um, definitely recommend checking her blog out. She's just awesome. Um, but what you will uh, find there is that she did a test of actually exposing. Um, we kind of collaborated. I gave her samples of all the Noodler's Eternal inks that I had, all the ones that were claimed to be fade resistant. Um, and she did swabs of them and put them up in her window for like nine months and, and then took the other half of the swab and put it away and didn't have it exposed and then brought them back out and put them together and showed which ones uh, faded the most. And there were definitely some trends between certain colors that would do it. Um, you know, some, you know, reds and blues typically did not do that great. Um, but then there were some other ones that were kind of surprising. So uh, definitely recommend you check those out. I'll put a link to that in this video. But um, so that, that would be my, my recommendations. But in general, it's not so much the ink you use, but how you store your notebook that's going to that's gonna do you the most good. Okay, Papa Kuma from Ink Nouveau. Um, you said you always include a piece of candy with your shipments. What is your favorite and how often do you sneak a piece out of the stockpile? <laughs> Well, in a perfect world for me personally, I would love to have chocolate because I'm a total chocoholic. Um, I love chocolate, but chocolate does not 
keep very well and it's not very good for shipping so we don't send out chocolate um, so we deal with you know we do a little Tootsie Pops or some we've done dum 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 dums before you know we stick with the lollipop related things because those are uh, a little easier to ship and deal with um, how often do I sneak stuff out of the stockpile almost never because I have been on a pretty aggressive diet and exercise regimen lately and I have pretty much cut out all sugary sweet kind of stuff which just kills me because I love that stuff but that's exactly why I am now on a diet and exercise regimen is <laughs> because I love that stuff a little too much uh, but anyway so for me it would be chocolate personally but uh, a bunch of our Goulet crew back there actually loves candy as well we use it as kind of a motivating uh, thing for them so we'll buy all kinds of candy whatever they prefer you know pretzel M&Ms are a big hit um, you know M&Ms of just about any kind um, York peppermint patties they disappear around the Goulet shop those things just go um, Twizzlers are another thing that are really popular so all kinds of good stuff um, Ted on Inc Nouveau so you said, I know that you've been complimented for the quality of your packaging, but I wonder if you've ever discussed trying to use less plastic, less packaging generally, for environmental considerations. Americans are often criticized for overhauling or overvaluing packaging beyond what is actually necessary and thus become wasteful. Um, yeah, we ship out a lot of stuff and it's definitely on our mind a lot about you know how much stuff we're using to get things to the places where they need to go now there's two sides to look at this okay yes you have the environmental impact of the packaging materials themselves um, you also have the impact of time effort you know service products if stuff arrives damaged um, if a product arrives damaged not only is it a bad customer experience it's money that's wasted it's fuel that's wasted by the USPS because they have to ship it again it's our time that's wasted it's a lot of energy that's expended just because we could have used an extra layer of bubble wrap or something like that. You would not believe what we've seen some of the packages go through that have gone out of this shop. And because we're sending pads of paper that could easily get wet or get bent in shipping, we sell bottles of ink that if they break, they'll ruin everything in the package, um, and expensive pens that are not you know, good to be damaged in any way through ink or through physical damage. So we, we really kind of have to be defensive about how we pack and ship things. Um, you know, and a lot of the products that we have are not pre-packaged themselves, you know, to be, to be protected very well. You know, a lot of the ink that we sell is literally just ink in a cardboard box, a glass, glass bottle of ink in a cardboard box. And it doesn't take a lot to break those in transit. So we kind of have to use what we have to use. We have had continuing discussions about using less to have less of an impact and things like that. We've tried, we actually went last summer through a big initiative to try to come up with some green alternatives. We tried, you know, eco stretch wrap. We tried um, eco bubble wrap. Um, we tried um, even some, uh, like a Giami machine, which is like a paper, this kind of cool paper machine, you know, um, packing stuff that I know like Crate and Barrel and other companies have used. We've tried all those things. And quite frankly, what we found is that either it was much more expensive to do it that way because the stuff just didn't work as well. So we had to use a lot more of it. Um, or just it didn't hold up as well in transit. And so it was really kind of disappointing because we went through a big initiative to try to do that. And we ended up kind of coming out of it and not really changing anything because it became too much of a trade-off of either time, money, or having to use more of the eco material to where it kind of just, you know, negated any value of, you know, being able to, to use less resources, I guess. So. It's definitely on our minds and we're gonna to continue to look for stuff. If you have any suggestions, like any companies that you know that do that kind of stuff, please shoot it my way and I'll definitely give it consideration. But it is something, and you know, we're not just some fat cats thinking, oh, uh, we don't care about the environment. We really are trying try to be sensitive about that stuff. Um, okay. <clears throat> RGH on Inc. Nouveau. You said, I like to keep a pen and notebook in the car for jotting down ideas and to-dos. Unfortunately, I live in the swamp of North Florida and fountain pens really don't like being left in the car in 95 degree heat. I agree. I don't care about destroying the looks. I just want it to work when I take the cap off. Likewise, I like to go for walks when I'm working through a problem, even when it's hot. And again, I take a pen with me generally stuck in a shorts pocket too hot to wear a shirt with a pocket and fountain pens with the hole fountain pens on the hole don't like being jogged around 
so there is often ink on the section and in the cap. Not cool. So any suggestions about which pens might solve these problems? At the moment, I keep a mechanical pencil on hand for both of these uses. Well, I mean, pencil is definitely an option. I mean, fountain pens themselves are not ideal in every situation. I will be the first to admit that. Um, you are kind of pushing the limits here of where a fountain pen may be practical. Um, but that said, one of the best pens that I've found in that situation, because it's cheap, it's durable, and it holds up pretty well in this purpose, is a Platinum Preppy, um, quite honestly. A Platinum Preppy, especially if you're using it with a converter, uh, the converter inside the pen will have um, kind of an air buffer because you'll have the converter with the ink in it and then you'll have air surrounding the converter and then you'll have the body of the pen. So the air kind of acts as a little bit of a cushion. If you fill it as an eyedropper, it's much more likely to leak. But if you add the Preppy with a converter, or a cartridge for that matter, um, the Preppy itself is cheap. Um, you know, if you have it in your pants pocket or something, it's not going to get beat up too bad because it's a pretty durable pen. Um, and then the cap itself does a pretty good job of sealing around the nib, and that's kind of where it's key, is that you're not going to have as much leakage coming out of that as you might with some other pens because it's going to stay pretty well sealed. One of the main problems you have when a car is really hot is you could either have evaporation of the ink out of the pen, which would cause it to write really dry, or if you have it with a, too much of an ink capacity, like in an eyedropper pen, it can get some burping and stuff through temperature variations, like especially if you're bringing it from the car into your you know, air-conditioned house or office space, and it's swinging you know, 20, 30 degrees in temperature uh, in a very short period of time, you could have some leakage and stuff like that. You know? And then carrying it around in your pocket, especially in your pants, it's gonna get jostled around a bit. You know, try and keep the nib pointed up, that's gonna help, so don't throw it in your pocket with the nib down, but try and keep it nib up, that's gonna help a lot. But you may decide to kind, of, to kind of experiment. So really any pen that you have that's got a sealed insert that goes around the cap, you know, like the Platinum Preppy, the Pilot Prera's got that. Um, I'm just gonna name, you know, price aside, I'm just gonna name pens off the top of my head I can think that have that. Like the Pilot Custom 74 has got that. Um, the Platinum Cool has got that. The Twisby um, 580 and the Mini has got that. So those are just kind of some ones I'm thinking about. Um, but they, those may be worth consideration for you. Okay, um, Laban on Ink Nouveau said, what do you do to the pens that you've used in video reviews and the nib nook? Do they get placed in the bottom shelf or does a warehouse have a copy of every pen and nib you sell? Um, I actually have a pretty extensive collection of pens in myself. Um, a lot of the stuff that I review is stuff from my personal collection. So I, I guess it's kind of a fringe benefit of doing what I do is I get, I get to amass a pretty large collection of pens. Um, sometimes it'll be a pen that a customer you know, has special ordered or that a customer has ordered and wants me to test it. Um, and so I will you know, use the opportunity to ask them if it's okay if I use that pen in a video, you know, since I'm gonna be testing it anyway. Um, a lot of times that's what I'll do. It may be a bottom shelf kind of situation. So it really kind of varies based on uh, what the situation is. But generally speaking, I usually buy buy a lot of them for myself and keep them in my own collection. Okay, uh, Derek B, you had an email and said, the Noodler's Ahab with Goulet nibs have become my daily carry pens. Perfect size, great ink volume, and they are so adjustable. Uh, what are Nathan's plans for the Ahab? Will your out of stock Ahabs be back? And will there be any new colors in the future? When will you sell Okay, well that's one question, and you've got another one that's kind of a, a different from that one. So, um, the Ahabs, there's like 56 or 58 colors of Ahabs right now. Um, and that's just a ton of colors for any pen. Uh, I've talked to Nathan before, and he says that the material that that pen's made out of, there are literally just like thousands of combinations of colors that he could come up with. So really, it's kind of whatever he feels inspired to do. You know, he might tomorrow just come out with 25 new colors for the Ahab, and I have no, I have no way of knowing that right now. It really depends on just what he feels like doing. Um, so I would say the chances of him coming out with future colors of the Ahab are like 99%. Um, as far as the ones that we don't have in stock, it's honestly just because Nathan's one guy. He makes all of the ink for Noodler's Ink himself by hand, and he coordinates the manufacture and the design of all of his pens, and a lot of the quality control too. So he doesn't actually manufacture the pens himself, but he's responsible for just about everything else. So really it's a matter of what does he have the time to do? A lot of times we'll see that if he's making a lot of ink, 
the supply starts to dry up on the pens. Then he switches over to pens and then supply starts to dry up on a lot of the ink. So that's usually what happens. If we're out of stock of any of the Ahabs, it's honestly just because supplies dried up and Nathan needs to get more made and he's focused more on ink. So it's really kind of a pendulum swing between his pens and his ink. Um, and then uh, you said, will you sell Goulet Pen Company or Ink Nouveau shirts and hats? I've got to have them. Um, we actually have a store on Zazzle uh, that we set up. It really, just, it wasn't, it's not a money maker for us. We set it up just so that we can get some Goulet swag for our own team. Uh, but you're welcome, you know, it's, it's open to anybody if you want to go and, and pick up whatever stuff you want. You're more than welcome to. Um, just look up Goulet Pens on Zazzle.com and you'll find us there. Okay. <clears throat> Kevin Landon on Facebook, you said, uh, since I began using fountain pens, the big question has been converter or bottle fill only pens. I started with converters and went to piston fill until they stopped working and had to be repaired. Went back to Lamy and Waterman converter models until I felt brave enough to buy a Pelican M200 recently. Where do you stand on the whole converter versus piston filling system on fountain pens? Okay, so I touched about this in a past Q&A about, you know, someone asked me what's my favorite filling mechanism personally. And for my own use, I like the cartridge converter. And that's really just because I like to change my ink colors a lot. I rarely use half a converter of ink before I switch it out and change colors anyway. Um, but a lot of people like to use one color or, you know, change colors a little less frequently than I do. So if that's the case, piston filling pens are pretty good. Um, the downfall of piston filling pens, some of them, is that they are hard to maintain, you know, if they're not easily disassembled. And then, yeah, it's like if a part breaks on that or if the seal goes bad or something, if it's an older pen and is discontinued, you may not even be able to get parts for the pen, um, especially if it's within the last 10 or 15 years. Pen companies have kind of gotten away from having user serviceable pens. Um, and then if it's, you know, uh, a more expensive pen and there are repair things, you're going to have to send it in, get it repaired by official company, whatever. It might take a while, might be kind of expensive, and that's kind of a drawback. Nice thing about the cartridge converter is if the converter goes bad or whatever, most of the time you can just, you know, take it apart, lube it up, and it'll keep on going. But if it really just does go bad completely, you can just replace the whole thing, and it's usually like a 5 or $10 solution, depending on the brand. So for me personally, I like the cartridge converter just because it's very versatile. You can use cartridges, you can use converters, or you can often convert them to an eyedropper. So you got three different ways to fill certain pens. Um, and then, you know, the, but the pistons, I do have certain pistons I really like. You know, the Pelican ones are pretty good. Um, not the M200, those aren't easily taken apart, but the M600 and 800, I've never handled a thousand, but um, the 6 and 800 I know, you can take those apart just like you can a Twisby, you know, 580 or Mini. Those are very serviceable. Um, so those are good. You know, the Noodler's pens, you can take those apart. You don't even need any tools to take those apart. So those are kind of a plus. But that still said, I will kind of stand by my converters. I do like those just because they're generally a little easier to maintain than your piston pens. Um, okay, and I'll answer uh, kind of one last question here. So, um, Super AE 1995 on YouTube. You said, I'm a student in high school and I tend to go through paper like water during the school year. Is there any type of cheap paper that works better than others? Um, okay, so really there is a trade-off between Generally speak, excuse me, generally speaking, there's a trade-off between, you know, paper cost and paper quality, and especially here in the U.S. Mainly the whole cost thing is because there's not a lot of great paper that's made here in the U.S. You've usually got to get it from Europe or from Japan. So the cost is really just in shipping that good paper to the U.S. Um, there's obviously a premium in general on good paper, but that's usually why stuff like Rhodia and Clairefontaine is so much more expensive than a typical Mead notebook or something that you might find here in the U.S. Um, so uh, I've, I've, I don't deal a lot in cheap paper mainly, you know, in the U.S. mainly just because um, it's accessible so many other places and you know, it would not be advantageous for my shop to carry it. But you know, black and red notebooks, I've heard good things about those. I've used some of those and their paper is pretty decent. Um, as far as copier paper goes, you know, like a printer paper, that's some of the most economical stuff. Um, here in the Goulet shop, we use HP 24 pound laser jet paper. Um, in the past, we used HP 28 pound, but that was discontinued. So we switched to the 24. It's not quite Quite as good as the 28 was, but for the price, it's pretty awesome. It's like you can get it for like eight or nine bucks a ream, which is 500 sheets. 
that stuff is pretty darn economical. Granted, it's just blank paper, it doesn't have any lines or anything like that. Um, but you can always put a line sheet behind it if you want. You know, if you it's you know it's it's good for general note taking and stuff like that if you don't need the lines. But if you need lines, you know, the printer paper is not going to be ideal for you. Um, HP 32 pound premium laser paper is is awesome stuff. That's more like 20 bucks a ream, but still is really really good stuff. I've used that before. Um, Staples has this line called Bagasse or Bagasse. I don't know how it's pronounced. Forgive me, um, but that stuff I've heard can be pretty good. I've heard swings about their quality control and stuff like that. So you know, if it's a lawn fountain pen network. Just do a search for Staples Bagasse, and you may see um, you know some different different reviews there. Um, so that's kind of what I just have off the top of my head. I'm sure there's other stuff out there. Maybe if you know of any, put it in the comments here. But those are some of the ones that come to mind the most. Okay, so that kind of covers me for questions that I'm going to do this week. Um, next week, I am going to kind of plan on doing a little bit of a theme. Okay, so I mentioned how I kind of wanted to start up some themes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the theme out there. The theme for next week is going to be um, starting out in the fountain pen hobby. If you're new into fountain pens, uh, I want your questions to be geared around that theme. And that's kind of going to be what I'm talking about, just getting into the hobby. Okay, so if I've got a lot of videos out there uh, called Fountain Pen 101. You may want to check some of those out, but I know that I didn't cover everything in Fountain Pen 101. I kind of just covered the basics. So you may have questions that are geared around things that I may have left out in those videos, or something that you didn't quite understand from the video and you just need some clarification on. Or maybe there's just something else that's kind of a step above that a little bit that you want me to cover. Um, I'm just really kind of open. Anything that's just getting into fountain pens, so whether it's related to pens, ink, or paper, you know, feel free or how the F3 interact, um, you know, by all means, uh, I would love to hear what your questions are related to kind of starting out new into the hobby. So that'll be for next week. That'll be um, September the 13th. And um, that's, that's about it I'll have for this week. So I hope you have a great week next week. Hope you're enjoying the Q&A format. I'd love to hear your feedback. If you do have your questions, you know, please post it on this video in the comments on YouTube or on Inc. Nouveau in the blog comments. Feel free to hashtag on Twitter, QA, or you can leave it on Facebook as well. Or you can also shoot an email to me at brian at gouletpens.com if you have any questions. So thanks so much. I appreciate you sticking with me, and uh, I like kind of just hanging out with you on this video here. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to comment them. Otherwise, just have a great week, and right on.